Meta. As you know, my name is David. I am the creator and host of CVS. In this episode of Meta, I'm going to offer some responses to Nick and Matthew. That's Nick Stumphauser and Matthew Murdoch, because Nick had Matthew on his own podcast, which is called The Prodigal, recently. Uh, he published it on September 4th, if I'm not mistaken, just a few days ago. And uh, he gave me a heads up. He said I might find it interesting. And sure enough, I did. And I asked him for permission to do a little meta episode, a sort of an analysis, some responses. And so uh, he said, sure, go ahead. And uh, that's what we're doing today. So I'm only going to deal with about five minutes worth of actual footage from that interview. And it's a substantial interview. It goes on for about an hour and a half, a little bit longer. But uh, check out nickstompauser.com for more information about his podcast. So anyway, let's get right into it. As usual, I'm just going to play little clips and uh, respond to them. So here we go. All of that doubtful stuff, I totally get it. And like prayer, like my wife is going through some horrible stuff right now, okay? Crippling depression, all hmm. of this stuff. All of these people are praying for her. Like, oh, we're praying, oh, we're praying, oh, we're praying, oh, we're praying. And it's just like, why isn't anything happening? And right, I, right, I right. wanted to forward you something I sent to David. I'm like, well... If, and, and the answer you get is God either says yes, no, or later. Prayer is at the center. It's at the heart of the religious life. And many refuse to pray because their prayers weren't answered according to their expectations. I've talked about this before in my podcast. St. Alphonsus Liguri says, if you want to be saved, pray. And if you don't pray, you cannot be saved. It's that simple. You have to pray. Now, as to this comment that God says yes, no, or later to every prayer, I don't have much to add to that. It's self-evident that God is wiser than I am, and so that when I request something, it might be good for me, so he can give it to me immediately or later, or it might not be good for me. So he'll say no. I mean, this is self-evident, and uh, I don't see any alternative to this perspective that I offered him. Now, it's possible that some would find my advice too general, too broad, but uh, I think we should always put emphasis on first things. Put first things first, have that solid foundation, Jesus Christ, and then you can build. You can build on that. But if you don't know that God is wiser than you are, then you might be tempted to stop praying because your prayers aren't being answered. And I've seen this happen. So we need to remind ourselves who is God and what is God. He is infinite in every perfection. He is the source of every good. So once we have that in perspective, then we can start dealing with creatures and put everything in relation to God, because everything needs to be understood in relation to God. So we have to put first things first. So that's why my answer was very broad and general, and I stand by my answer. If Matthew is frustrated by my answer, then that's a goad to prompt him to look at God. What, Who and what is God? What is that first commandment? Why is it there? What does it mean? And what are all the logical implications of it? And if Matthew or someone else listening comes to the conclusion that there is no God, there are logical implications for that too. And so those need to be looked at and examined. But we need to take seriously the first things and the first commandment, and we need to look at it. Whether you're an atheist like Nick, or whether you're a monotheist, or whether you're a Christian struggling with your faith like Matthew, you need to look at the first commandment. Take a look at it. Everything flows from that. Or something. So mm. that's the same as saying absolutely nothing. That's the same as flipping a. <laughs> that's the same as flipping a coin. It is. Uh, you know, it's right, the right, same right. thing, right? Like, like, oh, you just weren't praying according to his will, or the time wasn't right. It's just like, okay, so then why do it at all? Right. Of course, you can neglect your prayers. Of course, you can. But the church teaches that you cannot go to heaven if you persist in that folly. If you persist in believing that contingent things are not contingent, and that up is down, and that good is evil, and evil good. You are falling away from reality. This is not some mystical mumbo-jumbo. God is reality. God is the source of every good. We know that by the contingent things. So when you stray from God, when you deny God, you are falling away from God. You are falling away from reality. This is insanity. So we need to put first things first, and we need to look to God the Father, and we need to look to Jesus Christ, and we need to look to his church. 
So we look to God the Father, we look at the history, and we decide that Jesus Christ is the Messiah promised by the Jews. And we look at authority, and we decide that the church that Christ founded with infallibility, authority, and indefectibility is the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and that it is one holy Catholic and apostolic. And we submit to the church because she's a good mother. And so we listen to our mother when our mother tells us that we have to pray. And so we pray. It's that easy. Now, St. Augustine famously said that if there were obvious advantages to praying, then everyone would pray. If there were obvious advantages to belonging to the one true religion, then everyone would mechanically and greedily hop onto that bandwagon because that's human nature. So God allows the good to suffer. God allows the evil to profit. And God allows a mixed bag, like you said, Matthew, a rolling of the dice would give you the same outcome because otherwise everyone would just seek that good and they would mechanically go through the motions and there would not be that corresponding love, which is the only reality that separates those who go to heaven from those who go to hell. Those who go to heaven participate actively and willingly in that love that is God. They become that fire, so that fire is not a source of torture to them. Whereas those who reject God and put the contingent things first, they too will be engulfed in the flames of God's love, but they will suffer because they are not oriented properly. They have not chosen life. They have chosen eternal death. And so it's a very simple alignment with reality. If you want to be healthy and happy, then you need to respect your nature, your human nature, which was given to you by God. And to do that, you need to acknowledge who you are, what you are, and where you come from and where you're going. Lately, I've been feeling condemned again. Like, I just know I'm not living up to the really hard things in Scripture that Christ says, if you're my disciple, you're going to put me before your wife, your even life itself. And I realized, dude, I'm not living that way. So Matthew Murdoch admits that he's not living up to the ideal standard set by the God-man Jesus Christ. That's humility right there, acknowledging reality. I can say the same thing. We're in the same boat, right? But what's the difference between myself and Matthew? The difference is not that I'm holy and Matthew is not holy. The difference is that I look to Jesus Christ I look to the Blessed Virgin Mary and I look to the saints as examples of what it looks like to be perfect as the Father is perfect. What does it look like to love God above all things, including your, your very self? What does it look like to follow the first commandment? What does it look like to follow all of the commandments? Because if you violate one jot or tittle of any of the commandments, you violated all of the commandments. This is what Jesus teaches us. So who do we look to? Do we look to David Ross? No. Do we look to Matthew Murdoch? No. Do we look to Nick Stumphauser? No. We look to Jesus Christ, God incarnate, and his saints. Above all, his blessed mother. This is who we look to. And how do I know this? Because the church teaches me that this is what we do. In scripture, Paul says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. So don't be surprised. No one else is surprised. I'm not surprised. God is not surprised. So why are you acting like you're surprised? You're wasting time. Just look to the saints and humble yourself and acknowledge where you're at and just ask, what can I do today to take a little step forward? How can I advance? How can I become more holy, more virtuous, and more Christ-like? It's that simple. Anything else is a complete waste of time. So when God says, like, put me before your wife, put me before your kids, is that the same thing as saying neglect your wife, neglect your kids? Yes, Nick, this is what the church teaches. The church teaches for husbands to neglect their wives and children and for wives to neglect their husbands and their children. Yes, this is what the church teaches, obviously. Everyone knows that. Just ask the four horsemen of the apocalypse or Aaron Ra or Matt Dillahunty. Or if you think you detect a little bit of sarcasm in my answer, you could take three seconds 
and Google it and find out what the church teaches, right? It's not that hard. I love my family more than I love God. Now, granted, I don't believe in God, but... Yeah. So, it's all about the first commandment. If you don't acknowledge God, if you don't believe in God, you're violating the first commandment. So how can you have the grace to pray? How can you build grace upon grace if you don't even have the grace to pray? It's a dogma of the church that we're given sufficient grace. Each human is given sufficient grace to be saved. Now, of course, there's a lot of drama involved and there's an arc. There's that character development. There's that old saying that every saint has a past and that every sinner has a future. So obviously there is a lot of room here for growth, for change, for two steps forward, and yes, one step back. And I was atheist 25 years of my life. I'm now a faithful Catholic struggling and striving, just like Matthew Murdoch, to take steps forward and to become a saint, even though it seems ridiculous, it looks impossible, and it is impossible. But as Tertullian famously said, I believe it because it's impossible. I believe it because it is absurd. Just as when we look at the contingent, we know that the absolute is. There's an absurdity there. There's a ridiculousness of that whole paradox of the finite and the infinite being a nothingness, God, the creator, and me, the creature. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. If you're trying to escape from the ridiculous and the absurd, there is no escape. The atheists have one way of dealing with paradox, and the Catholics have another way of dealing with the paradox. They can't both be right. In principle, I suppose it is possible that they're both wrong if some other worldview happens to be the one true religion. But uh, as I've said time and time again on my podcast, there are many, many good reasons to believe that the Catholic Church is the one true religion and no good reasons to believe that any other candidate is even remotely reasonable. So if you're in doubt about what I mean, I've got many meta episodes talking about this. You might want to start with doubt, faith, and reason, and uh, the architecture of doubt, the different episodes that talk about where my certainty comes from and how you can have certainty, because Christ is not stupid. He left us with a church, and he left us with signs by which we can recognize the one true church. These are called the four marks. The church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And if we focus on the holiness, we can see the saints as an example of that. So my prayer for Nick, and my prayer for Matthew, and my prayer for myself, and for everyone else is the same prayer. True and lasting faith true and lasting faith. And that begins with the acknowledgement that God is God. I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, you know, do you love God more than you love your parents? And this guy's a Catholic. And he said, yeah, I do. And I just could not wrap my mind around that because to me, it seems like a fear tactic. To me, it seems like love me more than your family or I'll send you to hell. That's not love to me. All those in hell abused their free will. They chose to make of themselves a god. They put themselves first instead of putting God first. So God does not send anyone to hell, but God allows in his mercy, in his infinite mercy and love, he allows those who hate him to flee, to fall away from him. Because there would be nothing worse for those reprobate souls than to be in God's presence, in proximity with God in heaven. So he allows them to fall away forever and to have their little niche, their little corner of hell. It's the mystery of iniquity 
which is tied up with the mystery of free will, will never understand it. Don't try to understand it. We'll never comprehend it. But we can apprehend it. We can apprehend the story of Judas, and we can look at his example, and we can say, no, that is not the example I want to follow. I want to follow the example of the eleven. And just as Judas Iscariot was given sufficient grace to be saved, but stubbornly said no, persisted in his proud folly, we too are given sufficient grace, and we too can say yes to grace, and we can be saved. So that's what we have to do now, while we have time. We don't know how much time we have left. We might die this very second. This life is so brief. We need to gird our loins and get down to work. The very serious but joyful work of becoming a saint. They say that, you know, we can have this personal relationship with God. I don't feel like that. I feel like I know I feel like I know a bunch of facts. Yeah. I know a bunch of facts about God. I can answer all the Sunday school questions. I could do all that, but do I know him like I know uh, my wife? No. No. Who do you have a more intimate personal relationship with yourself? Or your wife. There are things that you haven't told anyone, not even your wife, but God knows them. Shameful things, regrettable things, but also joys. Joys that can't be put into words, observations, desires. All of this God has access to. It's ridiculous to point to a shadowy analogy of a relationship on this horizontal dimension among humans and to say that it's greater than or more real than the personal relationship that we have with God. It's absolutely absurd. You don't know who and what God is if you think that your relationship with another human being is more profound and more personal than your relationship with God, you have no idea who or what God is. Your very being, every breath you take, every heartbeat, every thought, word, and deed is in Christ, with Christ, and for Christ. Everything is grace. Everything. This is not a bumper sticker. This is not a cute, catchy slogan devoid of meaning. It's not wishful thinking. It's reality. Everything is grace. Is evil grace? No, because evil is an orientation. Evil is a way. It's a falling away from God, from the good, from everything that's good. So everything is grace. So when you talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you need to know that it is a fact, it is a reality, that you right now have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ, the God-man, is cooperating with you perfectly, flawlessly, gracefully, subtly, God created our human nature. Not only that, but God took on our human nature. If you don't think that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then you don't know Jesus Christ. You need to meditate on the contingent and the absolute. You need to meditate on the infinite and the finite. You need to meditate on good and evil. You need to meditate and you need to pray because until you realize how close God is, you may as well be a Muslim or a Protestant and just shrug your shoulders and say, well, I don't know. And we can't know. It's a form of agnosticism. We don't have access to that. We don't have a personal relationship with God because he is transcendent but not imminent. 
we know that the Catholic Church is the only true religion, if for no other reason than because we alone have that knowledge of transcendence plus imminence. It's not either or, it's both and. This is the Catholic way. Ask and say, okay, so do you know God? Mm. You know him personally. Can you demonstrate that? Show Where is he? Show him to me. Yeah. And if I have to use my imagination, if you say, oh, yeah, well, I know him. He's like, uh, imagine this, imagine that. I don't want an imaginary stuff. I yeah. want to know him. If he's a person, I want to know him. I want to have him. That desire that Matthew has to know God and to have a personal relationship with God, that desire is a very good thing. That's the spark that can become a flame. As St. Augustine said, if you desire to love God, then you do already love God. Now, is there room for improvement? Yes, always. For all eternity, we'll be improving on our love. If, God willing, we make it to heaven. So that desire is a good thing. Now, Matthew asks, where is this God? Show me, where is Jesus Christ on earth today? When Jesus ascended into heaven to the Father, the apostles were upset and Jesus said to them, it's better that I go. Because if I don't go, I won't send you the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit which will guide you, the church, into all truth. It's better for you that I go. So when Matthew asks me, show me the Savior, show me the God-man, show me Jesus Christ, here and now, I just point him to the church. Do you know how many times per second Jesus Christ is being called down from heaven into the Eucharist. It's sustaining, it's literally sustaining the material universe, the Mass, the Eucharist. So you want to have a personal relationship? You want a concrete experience with Jesus Christ? If I told you that Jesus Christ was coming to such and such a place at such and such a time, you'd be there. Millions would come. And yet the churches are empty. This lack of faith hurts Jesus Christ. It makes him suffer physically emotionally, spiritually, in every way, in ways we can't imagine. This lack of faith hurts the God-man. It's an infinite insult. Reparation needs to be made, and reparation is being made. Reparation was made on the cross, and reparation is being made through prayer and the sacraments in the church. So you can be part of the problem or you can be part of the solution. It's just that simple. And so I am striving to be part of the solution. And I recommend to one and all, family, friends, acquaintances, enemies, everyone, every human that ever lived, past, present, and future, I recommend to one and all to be part of the solution. And that means to be part of the mystical body of Jesus Christ. As my atheist walls are being broken down, I see the temptation to become less intellectually rigorous because it is comfortable to have a cohesive worldview, right? It's comfortable yeah. to be able to say, oh, this all fits together perfectly. It's seamless. And then the, to just ignore the areas that are just blatantly yeah. missing reality. Like they're, they're not even yeah. close. So this is what we call a false dichotomy. Nick is portraying two options. So we've got the absurdity of 
atheism, and Nick admits that atheism is absurd. And the only other alternative is the absurdity of self-delusion and lies and fantasy. But there's another option, which is to seek the truth, to find the truth, to worship the truth, to submit to the truth, and ultimately to become united with the truth. This is the only sane option. And it presupposes that there is a reality and that there is a truth. And Nick himself admits that there is a reality, an objective reality. Because he admits that we can stray from that reality, that we can, as he says, blatantly ignore reality. You want to be sure of yourself. But this guy, G.K. Chesterton, a Catholic mm-hmm. guy, you've probably heard of G.K. Chesterton. He says, if you want to be sure of yourself, he said the most, the people who are the most sure of themselves are the people in the mental institutions. Oh, you know, shit. that guy is so sure of himself that he is the queen of England. You cannot convince him. Every argument right. you have, he has a counter argument of why he is the queen of England. He's the most sure of himself of anyone or a singer who can't sing. Yeah. An American you're, Idol. You're dead accurate. They're sure of themselves. You don't want to be sure of yourself like that, dude. You want to have that skeptical mind or else you're that's when you're sure of yourself and all of your stuff fits together, that's when you can be assured that you're probably the furthest away from any it, the real truth. So, this whole question of certainty is conditional. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then the Catholic Church is the one true church, and all of her dogmas are infallible, and we should submit to her in everything, giving assent in mind and will to all of her teachings, even the teachings that are not infallible, and hence my strong loyalty to the Pope and the bishops who teach in union with the Pope. It is not enough to submit only to the infallible teachings. That would be ridiculous. That would be a very impoverished and lopsided and unnatural faith if one limited oneself to the infallible proclamations. Every certainty is a conditional certainty. If this, then that. We have axiomatic assumptions. It's the same thing with the natural sciences. It's the same thing with philosophy. It's the same thing with theology. And only God himself is not subject to any axiomatic assumptions. This is the one solid truth upon which we can build religion, upon which we can build theology, upon which we can build philosophy, and upon which we can build natural science. This is why I'm comfortable being a young earth creationist, even though most people in the Catholic Church look at me like I'm insane, because they are so enamored and enthralled by the natural sciences that they think that they can invert the hierarchy of sciences with impunity, that they can place the natural sciences above philosophy and philosophy above theology and theology above Christ and his church. This perverted inversion is really at the heart of all theistic evolution, old age creationism, and all these other theories. There's a perverted inversion of the hierarchy of the sciences. And so, again, we need to go to first things. We need to go to that first commandment, build everything on the solid foundation of God and the God man, Jesus Christ. That's where I'm a little bit worried about David, because when I first started listening to him, it wasn't as apparent, but now I start to see like he's bought into the cult side of Catholicism, not the religion side, the cult side. And there's, I think, a distinction. Well, I agree that there is a distinction to be made between a cult and a religion. There is a distinction to be made, but it's not a clear-cut distinction. It's a very loose set of criteria that we can use to distinguish a cult or a sect from a religion. And, of course, there are distinctions that could be used to distinguish the one true religion from all the false religions. But uh, this is really neither here nor there, because I don't belong to any Christian sect. I don't belong to any Catholic independent movements which might be accused of being a cult. There are many such organizations. 
and the church allows them to flourish, and the church will take seriously any claims against these independent movements within the church, and will come to a decision about whether they've strayed too far or not. And if some organization goes astray, the church will correct them. And if they come back, so much the better. And if they don't, so much the worse for them. It's the same for everyone. We can stray. We're allowed to stray. There's no one policing me. There's no one reading my mail. There's no one forcing me to stay. I came freely and I can leave freely. When I put money in the basket at church, it's voluntary. Everything I do, I do freely. I've never ever felt coerced, pressured, bullied. I've never been deprived of sleep. I've never had my diet controlled. I've never had anything controlled. If I fast on Fridays, it's because I want to do something for Jesus Christ. The church encourages me to fast on Fridays. And the church commands me to fast on certain days. It's true. But if I don't like it, I don't have to do it. I can leave. I can sin. I can go to hell if I want to. I can. And it's the same thing for you. So let's choose wisely. Um, he's going for it hard. And, and he even says it too. It makes me cringe when he's like, yeah. If they find out one thing that they said was wrong, he's like, I'm abandoning Christianity altogether. I'm like, do right. you really think that they didn't get one thing wrong? The laws of thought and the laws of logic are universal. So if the church is infallible, it can't be wrong in its infallible pronouncements. This is not rocket science. I'm not some freakish fanatical cult member. I'm a Catholic and Catholics believe that the dogmas are infallible. Why? Because that's what the church teaches. It's not optional. And if you want to doubt that, then you're back to Protestantism. And if you want to doubt the Bible, then you're back to monotheism. And if you want to doubt monotheism, then you're back to solipsism. I'm happy to doubt with you. I can go all the way with the doubt. That's what brought me to God in the first place. So there's no threat to me. I'm not threatened by doubt. Doubt is your friend, right? But we need doubt, faith, and reason. And reason tells us that if the church is saying that this is an infallible truth and it's not true, then there's a contradiction there. Contradiction is not from God. So I will abandon Jesus Christ if the church contradicts herself on these infallible proclamations. And I encourage every Catholic to do the same. Now, has anyone in the church ever said anything that wasn't true? Is this, is this the question? Could anyone really seriously think that I am that naive and foolish? That I think that every human being that ever called himself a Catholic has been completely infallible in everything they've ever spoken? So it's only the infallible pronouncements that are infallible. And so Matthew has no reason to cringe when I say that I'll abandon Jesus Christ if he contradicts himself. Because I don't worship a lunatic and I don't worship a liar. I worship the Lord and the Lord cannot contradict himself. And Christ and his church are one. But there is a, ro a romantic aspect of Catholicism that I think David has seen and that he's fallen in love with that I, yeah, that I desire. I, I want it. I do too. I, do, I want it too. So again, this desire is very good. Nick and Matthew both admit to having this desire, and this is very good. This is a very good sign. I remember when I was an atheist, one of my closest friends, whom I've known since infancy, when he converted, he confronted me with some tough questions, some philosophical questions and existential questions about life, the meaning of life and eternity. And my answers were weak because I was an agnostic atheist at the time. And I was honest with him. I told him that I want what he has. I want that security. I want that peace. I want that joy. I want that contentment. I want that meaning. I want all of the good things that he has. I, I want it. I just don't happen to believe it. And to make a long story short, he prayed for me and I converted eventually. I do thank him for those prayers. And I believe that they were instrumental, very instrumental in my conversion. And so I, I thank him for that very sincerely.
So I'm, I'm moved and I'm touched by any atheist that would admit the same thing. And here Nick Stumphauser is admitting that to me indirectly through Matthew. And Matthew's saying the same thing. So we're all in the same boat. We all want meaning and value and purpose and love, ultimately. And like I said at the beginning of this, I'm not different from Nick and Matt in as much as I'm holier. I'm not holier. I've just said yes. I've been given the grace, and I've said yes. And that tiny spark of faith that I was given by the grace of God, I was able to nurture it, to protect it, and by God's grace, to build, constantly build, day by day, little by little, that flame of faith. And I do want it to grow into a raging fire, and I believe it is possible. I believe that I can be a saint. And it's not because I'm holy now. It's because I'm unholy. It's because I'm wicked, and I'm selfish, and I'm proud. It's because of that that I want to be holy. I want to be humble, and I want to be modest, and it's because I'm vicious that I want to be virtuous. So we're all in the same boat, and I'm here to encourage Nick, I'm here to encourage Matthew, and I'm here to encourage anyone. That's why I do this podcast. It's to encourage the listener, the anonymous listener, the atheist, the agnostic, the Muslim, the Jew, the Christian, the everyone. We all need to keep our eyes on the prize. We all need to remember who and what we are and who and what God is. We need to put first things first. And I think... But there's some serious things. Of, but it's the thing, too, like, we just have to give in, you know? I was like, I don't know. I don't want to give in. I'm scared to, like, pray to Mary. I'm scared to do any of that stuff. I still don't want to do that. But I never had a problem with Mary, even though I was raised Protestant. Even though I was atheist for 25 years, I had zero problem with Mary. So I cannot claim that I can relate to Matthew's concern here. I can't claim that. But what I can do, all I can do is is remind him and all Protestants and even Catholics who struggle with Marian doctrines. All I can do is remind you that you are very comfortable asking your friends, your family, your pastor, your priest to pray for you. You're very comfortable with that. And rightly so. It's natural. God created our human nature and he took on our human nature and we can see Jesus Christ praying and requesting prayers. We see so many examples in the Bible of good Christians praying for each other, requesting prayers from each other, requesting prayers for people that, in their family and people they've never met. We're all familiar with this. We're all inclined to acknowledge the communion of saints, all of us Christians. So why the sudden exception with Mary and the saints in heaven and the holy souls in purgatory? Why the resistance? When Jesus Christ clearly said that he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So there is no obstacle to this doctrine of the communion of saints. There is no real obstacle. There's no substance to the objections, none whatsoever. So I ask you to pray for me and I encourage you to ask others to pray for you and to not limit yourself. Ask for prayer. Participate in the communion of saints. I would actually be fine now with like annihilationism, like yeah. eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Who, who cares? All lights over. I just want to sleep and go away forever. Because sometimes I don't really want to live forever. I don't want... I'm just tired and I'm tired of stuff. And I'm just like, dude, I just want to fall asleep and never get up and just lights out. I think that'd be nice. So Matthew says it would be nice if death were the end and complete annihilation was the only outcome. Every miserable reprobate soul in hell agrees with Matthew. That would be nice. There's nothing better for those in hell. 
So Matthew is speaking like one who's burning in hell. So allow me to offer another perspective, the perspective of those who are burning in purgatory and burning in heaven. The saved, the saints, the holy souls. Their perspective is that life is good. God is good. There's nothing better than beholding God, being close to God, getting closer to God, knowing God, loving God. There's nothing better. And the saints all agree with Matthew that it's better, that nothingness, that annihilation is better than hell. But it's not an option. The church clearly and infallibly dogmatically teaches that hell is real, it's horrible, and it never ends. It's eternal. There's no way out. So we can dream about annihilation, we can fantasize about annihilation, but it's not a reality. So think about which camp you're representing when you start talking about annihilation, when you start promoting this fantasy, this lie about complete and utter annihilation. Think about who you're serving. Are you serving God? Or are you serving Satan? Think about it. So next time someone asks you about heaven and hell as the final two outcomes, choose heaven. It's it not straightforward nice enough. To just, yeah, just to not, it's too, yeah, too nebulous, too, uh, that's the problem. Like, if like Christianity, you said, you can't get a clear answer. It's too ambiguous. Yeah, if, if Catholicism were more straightforward, if it were more concrete, I think it would be incredible. It would be so much more um, peace-inducing as opposed to anxiety-inducing, right? Yeah. So who do you suppose is to blame for the confusion, the lack of clarity, the chaos here below? Who do you suppose is to blame for all of that? Why do you suppose we're so dim of wit and weak of will? See, this is why we need a church that's infallible, authoritative, and indefectible. Because in all times and places, People want to escape from reality. They want to blame God for everything. So we need the infallible teachings of the church to remind us that just a few thousand years ago, Adam and Eve walked the earth and they disobeyed. They disobeyed God. They listened to Satan. And that crystal clear mirror the mirror of the human mind, the human heart, the human soul. It was shattered by the disobedience of our first parents. And we see now, not clearly, but as in a fragmented mirror, as St. Paul says, we're getting a broken image of reality. We're having to piece together this mysterious and dark puzzle. But we can't blame God we have to acknowledge reality. The reality is that we are in a fallen state. We're in a fallen world. And there is a way back to paradise, and a paradise that's even better than Eden. And that way is the truth, and that way is the life, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. And so we cannot afford to ignore the teachings, the clear teachings of Jesus Christ and his church. These teachings are clear. They are sufficiently clear. It is a dogma of the church that we are given sufficient grace. We have sufficient clarity. We can know by the light of natural reason, without recourse to divine revelation, we can know God. We can know that he exists. We can know many of his attributes. And we can know that Christ is the promised Messiah. And we can know that the Catholic Church is the church that Christ founded. We can know this. 
we can know it and we can profit by it and we can have clarity. And if we put every human that ever lived on a spectrum from those who are most confused on one end of the spectrum, all the way up through the bell curve in that middle section where most of us reside and continue on to that tapering off top end of that curve where those privileged few have clarity and genius and perspective and wisdom and a remarkable access to love, light and truth. If we look at this spectrum, it's clear that the Catholic saints occupy that highest portion of the graph, and that the great mass at the bottom are destined for hell. Whether it's one-third of humanity, or more, or less, whatever it is, the confusion, the chaos, the worry, the angst, the anxiety, that's in the lower part. That's of Satan, it's not of God. And so we look always upward towards Christ and his saints. Look to the church. Listen to the church. It's not hard. It's not hard to know. I'm not confused about the dogmas. I'm not confused about what I need to do. I need to avail myself in a worthy manner of prayer and the sacraments. I need to love God above all things and neighbor for God's sake. I need to love my neighbor as myself. I need to strive to keep the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not ambiguous. They're not confusing. They're very clear. If you want to find out more information about what it means to keep the Ten Commandments, there are many books. There are libraries full of books about the Ten Commandments, about morality. There are many books about every aspect of the Church, cult, code, and creed. If you want to find out, you can find out. There's nothing stopping anyone from getting answers, and Jesus Christ is the answer to every question that's worth asking. So I'm not confused. To the extent that I am confused, and that I am lost, and that I am dim of wit and weak of will, the Church has an answer for me. It's because we fell from grace. It's because we're in a fallen world. So even my confusion is not confusing. I have certainty about everything that I need to have certainty about. We have an infallible way of knowing the essential saving truths. We have that. To say otherwise is to admit defeat and to commit yourself to nihilism. And then the only question is, why have you not killed yourself? already. What's stopping you? It's the only question that remains for the nihilist. Why? Why? But there is hope. There is light in the darkness. And as Saint Anselm famously said in his prayer for enemies, I want the same punishment for myself that I want for my enemies, namely true and lasting faith. That's what I want, God. That's my punishment. I want the fire. Give me that fire. Give me that light. Picture that light of God being diffused all the way from heaven through the nine choirs of angels down to the visible light that we see here on earth. We need the intercession of the saints and the angels. The angels can protect us. And if we call on them now, we can be conducted in the life to come to heaven. And above the angels are the archangels. And they can give us perseverance in faith and in all good works in order that we may attain the glory of heaven. Above the archangels, we have the principalities. By the intercession of the principalities, God can fill our souls with the true spirit of obedience. Obedience without which we'll never attain to the power of that next choir of angels, who are called the powers. And the powers can protect our souls against the snares and temptations of the devil. Mounting ever higher in this hierarchy, this ladder, 
of the angels, the nine choirs. We have above the powers, we have the virtues who can preserve us from evil and falling into temptation. So imagine never falling into temptation. This is one of the things we say when we pray the Our Father. I went to confession today and the priest told me my penance was three Our Fathers. He said, this is the most perfect prayer. It's the prayer given to us directly by God. So we pray not to be led into temptation. So if you avail yourself of the virtues, the fifth celestial choir, the virtues, we can be preserved from the evil, from all evil, and especially the evil of falling into temptation. Now, above the virtues, we have the dominations who can help us to govern our senses and overcome unruly passions. How many of us fall prey to passions and are overcome by them because we can't govern our senses. Of course, it's impossible for men, but with God, nothing's impossible. And God has given us the dominations. He's given us all nine choirs of angels. And above the dominations, we have the thrones, the third choir of angels. And these infuse into our hearts a true and sincere spirit of humility. Without humility, we'll never reach heaven. And above the thrones are the cherubim. With the help of the cherubim, we can leave the ways of sin permanently and run always in the paths of Christian perfection, without which we'll never see God. And finally, above the cherubim, we have the first order, the highest order of angels, the seraphim. This is the choir to which Satan belonged. It's the highest order of angels, the brightest, the most beautiful, the most powerful. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of seraphim, the Lord can make us burn with the fire of God's love, the fire of perfect charity. So this is my prayer for you, Nick. It's my prayer for you, Matthew. And it's my prayer for all humans, past, present, and future. So that's it. Take care. We'll talk soon. God bless. Thank you.